Good afternoon, everyone. Before Sherry starts the meeting, I would just like to remind you all to make an effort to stop in before Friday evening and uh, sign the paperwork that will be in the red folder in my box and leave me your yellow folders in return. Sherry, can you hear me? We can hear you, Mr. Wayman. Thank you. Madam Mayor, when are we ready? For um, recording and um, ready to get started whenever you are. Okay. All right, it is 3.30 and we are now ready to start our um, study session on the water system plan update. Um, Mr. Peters, are you kicking this off? Um, no, that would be uh, Mr. Henney is going to kick off the water system plan. I think uh, uh, okay. Justin from HLA is also yes. going to uh, okay. participate here and that's, uh, so I'll leave it okay. at that. Okay, I didn't see Mr. Henney on there, I do now. Okay, Mr. Henney. Unmute, Joe. Unmute. There. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'm here finally, I think. Um, yeah, what we've asked you guys to come here today for is to talk about our water system plan update. The document we've been working on for a little over a year now is in a draft form. It is substantially complete. It's under review by the Department of Health. And it covers all the way from a system um, discussion on, on, and, and, and future plot projects listing and a financial statement that goes over all the financial health of the water department and future rate requests. So I hope all, everybody had a chance to review it. We gave you guys all thumb drives to plug in and look at it at your leisure. And to um, I see Justin Bellamy is the engineer from uh, HLA Engineering. He is the architect or author or draft person of this document. And he is the most familiar person with it. Um, ties better than I am. And I'm here as arm candy. So I would like to turn it over to... Uh, uh, just to follow through, he has kind of a uh, itinerary we want to go over, and we want to focus mostly on the uh, 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 our future projects in the financial chapter. But he'd be more than happy to discuss the uh, water system uh, um, outline of the system as a whole, or any of the other portions of the of the document. So, without further ado, I'll have uh, Justin start off. Thank you, Joe. Um, can everybody hear me? All right, good. Um, good afternoon, Mayor, Council members. Uh, appreciate the uh, having me on today to kind of give an overview of the water system planning effort, um, plan contents, and and uh, some of the recommendations that have come out of that. Um, uh, Teresa, are we able to pull up the document uh, yes, so sir. everybody can I, see? I I have the document ready and um, the uh, itinerary for pages. If you'd like me to go to a specific page too. Okay, perfect. So I, I'll uh, I'll probably point out a few uh, exhibits and and pages in the document as I go through this, um, just so you guys can see what I'm what I'm talking about and looking at. Um, again, uh, just wanted to give an overview of the plan and what's included in it. Um, some of the background information, uh, uh, the system analysis that has been done, uh, recommendations for system improvements and future financing of those improvements. So um, we'll start with just a little background. Uh, water system plans are a requirement, um, they're a WAC requirement uh, administered by the State Department of Health. Uh, they used to be uh, every six years you had to do an update that has now been extended to every 10 years. 
uh, the current plan approval for your guys's water water comprehensive system planning document expires um, later this year. So that's why we are have have begun the update effort. And as as Joe said, it's in draft form. Um, it has gone to Department of Health for preliminary review. Um, and we have reviewed and addressed comments that they've had um, and now uh, reviewing it with with uh, with you all. Um, just in general, uh, the, the purpose of the plan is to uh, demonstrate, um, you know, system capacity for both present and future water system demands. Um, it also uh, pro um, uh, provides eligibility for future funding opportunities um, with the uh, improvements that are identified in the plan. Um, in the beginning of the plan, we have uh, just an, an overview of, of system ownership and background information, uh, brief system description. I don't know how many of you are familiar with, with what all is involved in the city's water system. Um, it's quite extensive. Uh, you guys have six um, uh, source wells, uh, six booster pump stations, uh, eight reservoirs, um, uh, 14 PRV stations all across six um, what we call distribution system pressure zones or pressure levels because of the, uh, the changes in topography throughout the city. Um, and then there is a uh, radio uh, telemetry control system at uh, Public Works that um, uh, controls the whole thing. Um, and the since the last update, which was done in 2014, um, there has been several improvements that have been made to the system. Some have been development driven, um, such as the uh, booster pump station that's up on in, in the Valhalla Heights uh, area. Um, but they, we've also uh, completed a reconstruction of the Palm Park booster pump station, uh, the Goodlander booster pump station, um, and most recently, this last year, we completed installation of a new turbine pump in well number seven um, uh, that was installed to address some um, uh, well drawdown issues. Um, let's see, so, so background data. Um, the basic background planning data that we use um, to uh, evaluate the existing system and also look at future demands um, is, uh, is, is an important thing. Um, and the numbers that we use are uh, consistent with the projections and allocations that um, Yakima County has put together. Um, in the last 10 years, uh, I think the system has averaged about 1.2% growth per year. Uh, and the projection for the next 20 years, the, the base project projection that we used um, is around that same average annual increase of, of about 1.2%. Um, one of the other important things is uh, looking at meter data from the last six years to see if there's been any changes in um, usage uh, and demands of the system. Um, so we take uh, the, the data that Public Works provides uh, for water, all water services are metered, uh, all source wells are metered, and we take that data and look at it, analyze it, um, uh, see if there's any changes, and address any concerns. Um, right, right now, the city uses about 860 million gallons a year. Um, and I just wanted to point out one, one important thing to note uh, with that is um, about, so 40, about 42% of that is residential demand, uh, but 40% of it is industrial. And the remainder, the remaining 18% is a mix of commercial and city uses. 
um, and other demands. Uh, so a pretty high, high industrial demand, of course, um, along with the uh, residential demands. Um, what we also do with that, with that data is we use it to um, uh, come up with unit demands for the average residential user. Um, we call that an equivalent residential unit. Um, right now, uh, looking at the past six years of data, um, that average daily demand per ERU is about 380 gallons. Um, the ma maximum day demand per ERU is up to 1,012 gallons. So you have a pretty, there is a pretty steep um, uh, uh, peak demand throughout the system. And that's primarily due to uh, uh, water use as irrigation in the summer months. So, and the, and the city sees, um, public works sees that there's, there's substantial increase in, in uh, pumping and water use in the summertime. Um, one, one good thing to note um, that uh, public works guys do a very good job of is keeping track of, of um, water use. Um, the uh, Department of Health requires that all systems have less than 10% uh, what they call distribution system leakage or loss throughout their system. Um, the city has for a long time maintained well below that 10% average uh, and the city's current average is at about 4.3% um, for the last three years. So that's a good thing. Um, the, uh, with the unit demands and the population projections, we take that information and we come up with estimated uh, future demands 10 years out and 20 years out. Um, those are the target, uh, the 10 years, of course, um, the, uh, the target duration of the, of the plan approval with Department of Health. And then they also want you to look at 20 years out, so 20 year demand projection. Um, and then we take a closer look at that because of all of the distribution pressure zones throughout the system. Um, we need to look at each portion of the system and determine um, how much demand is occurring in each zone. So we also do a zone breakdown um, and we uh, worked with public works staff to, um, to check that and um, you know, make sure that we're showing demand where it occurs as, as close as possible and also making our best estimate of where future demand is going to occur in those um, varying pressure zones. Um, again, the majority with, with the high industrial use, the majority of your demand is in the lower zone or zone one, we call it, which is where all the wells are. Um, so uh, it's mostly residential demand in the upper zones of the system. So um, once we put together population projections, then we start to look at all of the system components. And we, we need to do an analysis of each system component uh, to, to see if there's any issues that need to be addressed, um, uh, both capacity and um, um, uh, operation and maintenance type of issues. Um, you know, we, we, we look at system design standards um, and we, we have a summary of those in the plan. Um, you know, we talk about things like uh, minimum pressures that are required to be maintained throughout the system, both under peak demand conditions and under fire float conditions. Um, we specify uh, the fire department's requirement for the maximum fire suppression storage uh, that's in the system that's stored in, in the reservoirs. Um, for you guys, it's, it's a it's a pretty high number. Um, it's 6,000 gallons a minute for four hours is what's required for fire suppression. And that's, and that's mainly due to the, the large industries in town. Um, and we, we, we also look at well water quality 
Um, I will say that there really has, has not been any changes in the past six years um, to the city's well source uh, water quality. So that's a great thing. Um, so the, the quick summary I gave earlier of the wells, um, six wells. So total well capacity is about 6,400 gallons a minute, um, assuming everything is, is <laughs> running full open, which doesn't happen very often. Um, there are six booster stations there uh, to get the water from uh, zone one up to the higher zones. Um, there are three booster stations that pump to zone three that um, can pump 3,750 gallons a minute. Um, there's two that pump from zone three to zone five with a maximum capacity of about 2,000 gallons a minute. And there's, uh, then there's the closed system booster pump station that sits up on um, in Valhalla Heights. Uh, that's, the, that's the last one. Uh, eight reservoirs distributed throughout all the way from the Lookout Point Reservoir to Goodlander Reservoir. Um, Teresa, can you pull up uh, page 76 of the plan? Sure, hold on one second. It's PDF page 76. There we go. So I don't know if you guys saw this um, exhibit in the plan. Uh, this is just a schematic representation of the city's distribution system, supply and distribution system. Um, uh, these zones that I'm talking about, uh, pressure zones, um, you can see the booster stations labeled in there. The wells are, are like little well houses um, depicted on there. And then the, the tank um, uh, symbols. Uh, and then the water that's stored in the reservoirs can be fed down through the zones through uh, what we call pressure PRV stations or pressure reducing valve stations. Um, and there are many of those throughout the system to keep a um, fresh supply of water to services as well as provide uh, fire flow um, in case of emergency. Um, let's see, and then the control system that, that runs the whole thing. Um, so we look at all these various system components, um, you know, the, the capacities and um, excuse me, just a minute. One of the main things that we need to look at is um, the reliability of the water supply capacity. Of course, well, well supply is one of the, is the most important um, piece of the system. And we need to make sure that there's adequate well supply capacity to, to uh, satisfy current and future demands. Um, Department of Health specifies several reliability criteria that need to be met. Um, and we look at each of those individually and um, make a determination of if, if you have adequate pumping capacity to meet those. And, um, you know, based on projected 10 and 20 year demands, uh, the, the system does satisfy those requirements. Um, you also have, there's also um, uh, generators in place at the largest sources of supply, which is well number seven and well number six. Um, and, uh, uh, portable generator hookups at all the other sites. So that's, that's good for reliability in the system. Um, and, uh, keeping things running. So, uh, we take a look at water rights. Water rights are a very important thing. Um, I'm going to flip to PDF page, uh, 95 real quick. Um, the really big table here uh, summarizes the water rights for the system. Um, and most, some of these are combined, but most of the wells have, have their own water rights or a series of water rights. Um, one of the things I wanted to note to you guys real quick is that um, uh, 
the inst what we call the instantaneous water right capacity um, is 5,500 GPM. So it's slightly lower than the, your um, rated pump capacity, assuming that all pumps are, are operating properly. Um, and so that's one, um, one area that, that, that limits the overall system capacity is that, that uh, difference between uh, what you can actually pump out of your wells and what the, your water rights, certificated water rights um, state. Um, and I'll get back to that here in, in a little bit. Um, reservoir storage analysis. Um, if we go back to page 87, um, this is just a, a, a figure that shows a, a breakdown of storage elements that are, be, are required to be maintained throughout the system in the various reservoirs. And so we've kind of color coded them to give you an idea of, of where these are at and what they mean. Um, there's a standby storage, um, which is to supply the system if, if, um, if one of your largest sources of supply is out of service. Um, fire suppression storage, talked about that volume. That's important. Um, that's uh, specified by uh, the fire department. Uh, we actually do, um, uh, we, we nest those two volumes, um, and that's something the, the fire department has approved. Um, so those are, whichever is the larger of the two, um, kind of um, uh, dictates uh, how much of the storage reservoirs are taken up by that volume. Um, uh, equalizing storage um, is the uh, purple color, um, and that's when you're the times when your well pumps can't keep up with and, and well pumps and booster pumps can't keep keep up with um, uh, peak hour demands. So those are demands that occur in the summertime when maybe a super hot day when everybody's watering at the same time. Um, and then, of course, operational storage. And that is just um, the the cycling of your pumps on and off. Um, all of the reservoirs have a little bit of operational storage um, so that uh, um, the, the pumps don't cycle too often. Um, and then this, the storage analysis, we do it for the, we look at the whole, the system as a whole. We also look at those individual pressure zones because certain zones are fed by, um, uh, booster pump stations and not directly by the wells. Um, so we have to look at analysis of each zone to see if there's any deficiencies in the um, different areas of the system. Um, we, we do a quick uh, analysis of PRV capacity just to see if those um, individual PRVs are keeping up with supplying water to some of the zones that are only supplied by PRVs. Um, not directly by a, a booster station or a reservoir. Um, uh, we do a complete system hydraulic analysis where we look at uh, system fire flows uh, and make sure that um, fire flow demands throughout the, the distribution system are being maintained. Um, And then after all of that review, we, we summarize it. And we put together a summary, uh, capacity analysis summary. Um, if you wanna to flip to page uh, 113, there, we have a table in there. The table is a little, looks a little bit odd and you'll see in there it's referenced Department of Health Worksheet 4-1. This is a format that they've um, requested, um, but it gives a good snapshot of, of what the overall system capacity is. I think you guys have probably seen some of these numbers um, in, in the discussion, study session discussion you had uh, last week regarding the, the Crusher Canyon area. Um, so currently uh, the, what we call the, the physical capacity of the system is limited by instantaneous water rights or that um, instantaneous amount that can be pumped into the system. Um, 
so if if water rights are uh, acquired in the future from Department of Ecology to increase that amount, then uh, the next limiting component is going to be your source well capacity. So there, there's a there's a slight difference there um, in in ERU capacities. Um, and then uh, let's see. Then we look at system deficiencies, um, and those are actually right start on the right right on the next page. Um, and we summarize system just, um, deficiencies in, in three major areas, uh, water supply, water storage, and then water distribution. Um, and you, looking at the demand projections for the system for the next 20 years um, at the 1.2% growth rate, um, water rights uh, and source capacity are all adequate um, to supply the system to year 2041. Um, and again, the only um, uh, issue is the difference between pumping capacity and instantaneous supply capacity. Um, but even with that difference, it's still adequate um, with those projections. Um, there are some uh, um, well rehab and pump rehab and, you know, maintenance things that have to continue to be maintained uh, in order to, you know, pump the full capacity of the system and your wells. Um, uh, I, I mentioned earlier, uh, well seven, um, that was a project that was done because of declining pressures, declining water levels in that well. Um, and that's something that uh, definitely needs to be um, just uh, uh, um, tracked over time uh, because if as water levels and aquifers continue to decline, that can have an impact on the uh, amount of water supply that the system has. So um, we identify that as, as not an immediate improvement, but but something that definitely needs to be uh, kept in mind as as um, as time goes on. So, um, let's see. It, just a couple of highlights here. Uh, booster station capacity again is is adequate. We've made some recent improvements to some of the booster pump stations that have brought them up to um, uh, uh, current reliable um, capacity. Uh, the only thing we noted in there is um, increasing the size of the, the generator at one of your primary pumping stations, which is a combination of well and pumping station, which is located at um, uh, well six on, um, on Spires Road. Um, and let's see, storage, let's see, storage capacity is, there's plenty of storage capacity for the system as a whole. But again, when we look at that zone breakdown, uh, one of the things that we identified is as growth continues to occur um, in the uh, Valhalla area, um, which we also call the, the, the North, North Hill upper pressure zones, um, the storage capacity is limited up there for that uh, area alone. Um, that's the only source of the booster station and the reservoirs are the only source of water for the homes up there. Um, they don't get uh, water directly from the reservoir or from the wells, excuse me. Um, and so that's, that's uh, a, a, uh, a future, that would be a future um, uh, development related need that eventually that's going to need additional storage up there. Um, to serve some of the undeveloped uh, properties on the on the top of the hill, um, we also identified um, uh, one of the older some of the older infrastructure um, in the system, which is the uh, zone one tanks that are um, they're actually concrete tanks that are buried underground. 
Um, and those are aging and we identified that as, as something that continues to be need to be monitored and, and watched um, uh, and, and eventually may need to be replaced. Um, and then on the distribution side of things, primarily um, we're looking at uh, older pipes that um, are known to have uh, leakage um, uh, and also uh, in working with the public works staff, we identified um, uh, the need to upgrade the city's water service meter system. And so that's something that's been identified in the plan um, to look at going from a uh, direct read meter system to a radio read meter system. A um, lot of advantages, advantages to that, um, including uh, increase in accuracy, um, you know, the potential to, to have early leak detection for homeowners um, uh, and, and, and obviously reducing the amount of time it takes to do monthly meter reads. Um, so that's, that's something that we identified in the plan as well. Uh, um, we, um, one of the sections in the plan, um, talks about uh, water use efficiency um, goals and uh, measures to achieve um, water use efficiency goals. I know that that was presented at a council meeting back in December. Um, and so you guys have already gone over that. Um, again, the, the, another part of water use efficiency is, is making sure that your system maintains that 10% leakage standard. Um, and um, you, you guys are doing that, doing, that's, that's great. Um, let's see. So one of the things that we provided at the end of this chapter, just, just as a quick, um, quick item, uh, it, if we, we added up all the estimated savings um, from the efficiency goals, and you know, found that um, you know it could add, add up to almost twenty million gallons saved annually. Um, and just to to put that in perspective, um, you know, if if you did achieve savings like that, uh, reducing your demand, that's equal to um, equivalent to another one hundred and forty four ERUs. So, water saved is is definitely uh, adds capacity to your system or available capacity to your system. So it's important to continue to, to look at those goals and, and uh, try to achieve them. Um, the, there are several other planning elements that um, I won't go into, into detail on that Department of Health requires. Um, we have to look at wellhead protection um, and that's, you know, the city is part of a regional wellhead protection um, uh, um, planning effort, and they work together to, to uh, provide all those updates. Um, we have to ha provide an overview of the system operation and maintenance, um, as well as emergency response plan and several other items like that. Um, and we talk about um, design and construction standards for expanding the distribution system and how those um, system expansions are handled. Um, so those, those discussions are in the plan um, uh, to, to meet those requirements. Um, not really anything uh, identified as an, as an issue or problem with those. Um, uh, and then all of the water system improvements are summarized in um, uh, towards the end of the document, um, and we divide the Im improvement, um, the recommended improvement schedules into two sections. Um, one being operation and maintenance improvements. If we go to page one eight five, real quick. So this is. Um, there's more, more detail above describing each of these improvements, but this is the, the summary of them. Um, and these are 
things like meter calibrations, hydrant repairs, um, cleaning the reservoirs, um, rehabbing wells, replacing pump, pumps, just, just ongoing um, routine operation and maintenance of the system um, that's, that's, that's necessary. Um, uh, that's where we summarize those improvements and you can see um, the cost, uh, the estimated costs associated with those. Um, and then separately, we look at the capital improvements and we have, we actually provide a map of those because those are system improvements throughout the distribution system. So that's on page 187. So we, we come up with a, uh, a schedule um, for the improvements. Um, many of these are, are areas of uh, aging pipes, leaking pipes that um, you know, public work staff has identified um, as, as needing repair in the future. Um, and the, the, the year of improvement that we identify on there is, is an estimate um, and is intended to correspond with the, the schedule um, that we provide in the plan. Um, and if you go to page 204, we have a similar table to the O&M where we provide a summary of the costs and um, year of completion. So trying to spread those improvements out over a period of time, because um, it'd be very difficult to do all the, all the uh, improvements at once, it adds up a lot. Um, you know, some of these, uh, most of these improvements uh, on the right-hand side we've identified as just uh, utilizing uh, city um, capital improvement funds or reserve funds. Uh, but some of the larger projects we recognize may need some um, outside funding assistance, uh, you know, depending on exactly what year they take place and, and you know, how, uh, other projects that are, that are happening um, in the system. Um, let's see. So then the next important thing that we look at is, you know, how are we going to finance these improvements? So chapter nine is the financial plan. And we look at the pack, past six years of finances. And then on page 214, we put together a proposed, this is a big table, with lots of numbers in it. Um, but it's really just a summary of, of uh, the uh, budget. We start with the budget um, from 2020 and we project out um, future revenues and expenditures for the system, and then plug in the uh, improvements. And you'll see about in the middle of the table, we have rows in there we've identified um, O&M improvements, and then what I've labeled major uh, capital improvements. So those numbers, match up with the, the table of recommended improvements from, from that we were looking at before. And plugging those in and um, to spread these projects out and still, but still maintain um, positive fund balances in the uh, water system funds. Um, in order to accomplish this at the bottom of the table, if you scroll down a little bit, Teresa, if you can, you'll see that this is based on um, a projected revenue increases of about 3% per year. And that could be a combination of, um, of, uh, of new revenue coming in as well as um, uh, rate increases. So this plan that we've come up with and the fund balances, the, re the resulting fund balances are based on on those estimates. Um, and then the last thing that we look at is um, 
we, we have a short brief discussion on water rates. And if you wanna to go to page 217, you can look at that. Um, I just wanted to, to point out something real quick. Um, so the city's current water rate structure is a, what they call a declining block rate structure. Um, so as usage increases, um, uh, the price per, per uh, 100 cubic feet goes down. Um, and just for reference, I, we put in here an example of um, a, a, a different rate structure or a inc inclining rate structure um, and um, just to see the, the difference, um, just as, as, a, as an example um, of how, how the, um, the revenue stream would change with uh, an inclining block rate. Um, the, the, point, the whole point of that would be um, uh, to um, uh, promote um, water conservation um, throughout the system. And of course, this isn't a detailed analysis. It's just a, a quick, quick assessment of, of, um, of one potential option. Um, the uh, Department of Health asks us to look at rates and the rate structure, and this is a, a, a good tool, a resource to, um, to, to reference for uh, possible future rate studies or considerations. So, um, and then the document that you got, it's a lot of pages you can see. Um, there's a, a lot, there's a number of uh, background uh, documents and information um, that relates to the plan uh, that's included in the remainder um, of the document. So I guess with that, um, I don't know if uh, Joe or Ty, if you had anything to add um, or otherwise would be happy to answer any questions that you may have from the document. Well, thank you, Justin. That was very thorough. And thank you, Teresa, for getting those uh, PDF pages brought up accurately. Um, no, I think we presented it, like I say, thoroughly. Um, I'd like to entertain any questions um, that anybody might have, and then we'll kind of go from there for a while. There you go, Kevin. Kevin, I had a few. Um, so do we have any estimates of savings if we make that rate adjustment uh, where it, as the more you use, the higher the cost is? Do we have estimates of what others have saved using that rate? Um, savings in dollars or savings in gallons? Gallons. I, I do not. Um, I... Um, that's a great question. Um, I think it's a it's a tough one to answer though. Um, in in how much savings you actually uh, see, um, um, let me see. Did I try to remember if I put anything? That's kind of a double edged sword as well, Kevin. Because yeah. uh, you know everybody's wanting all the all the water purveyors in the state to come up with methods to conserve water um, as reasons we talked about. Um, so we looked at that, like I said, those two different rate structures and we kind of showed how they would come out about the same at the end. Yeah. And, it, and it, because of the water consumption is are higher in the summer. And I'm not quite sure how we're going to juggle that all around because, okay, it's just like right now with the gas tax. You know, nobody's nobody's driving because of the pandemic. And so all this fuel is being saved. And so the state's not making any money on the gas tax. And the same thing with us. If we get too efficient in savings, then we got to somehow figure out how to generate enough revenue to pay for our expenses. You know, yeah. so. And, right. you know, I, I did, um, one of the things I was trying to point out is, 
you know, there is a huge peak demand. And um, if, you know, savings in the peak season is going to help um, um, the, 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 the impacts and load on the system. And if that, if that peak can be reduced even some, um, you know, it, it, it uh, makes operation uh, easier. And yeah, it's, it's, it's tough to estimate exactly what the savings would be. An another, um, another structure that I see other communities use um, is kind of an in-between one where it's more of a, um, it, it's the same concept, but it's more of a, a flat rate, if you will, structure where it's, it's um, you know, you have your initial charge and then you have a charge for a, a unit of, of uh, demand over that, but then that amount stays the same. You know, it doesn't, the, the amount um, is, is flat or, or continues to be the same. So that, that's another option too, that I, is very common. Okay, so I don't know if I look at the screen, I keep going down to the left of it, which would be number one, which would be Cliff. Well, what, a couple of minor things, I guess, but tying it in with the, the rate, um, if or when we go to the radio meter reading, would would that allow us to read meters 12 months out of the year? And would that balance out what use? The, I, I agree that we use more water during the summer because of that. But that, when you look at that chart, that that looks like a big difference is that because of the billing and the meter reading that it has that extreme or, or is the winter time meter usage uh, told differently than our residential meters? Well, Cliff, AMR or automatic meter reading does several things I mean, like what Jess alluded to earlier was one is that um, you can read 12 months out of the year and it should be totally accurate, no misreads, no, no meters, especially during the winter. We, we read in October, we don't read again until uh, uh, March. And so during the, that period, there could be a meter gone dead. There could be a water leak. Um, and we won't know about it until we do the, the spring follow-up on reading. So, yeah, you get a 12-month read, you get, you get accuracy, and the customer doesn't get hit with a, a larger bill in the spring because the, the, the meter was leaking on their side of the meter. Yeah. Um, they can also then, depending on the system we wind up going with, they can go online and log in and look at their, uh, uh, their consumption numbers. They can um, um, say to themselves, gosh, you know, I'm using more water than I thought by washing my car three times a week or whatever. And so they can, they can like I say, they can go back and, and make adjustments to keep their consumption down or their bill down to a, an amount that they wanna pay. So yeah, there, there's all kinds of reasons to go to that. And, and sometimes the um, sometimes the, the the numbers are impacted by the timing of reads, you know, because it it takes a, a series of days to complete all the meter reads, um, you know, with a with an AMR or an automatic meter reading system um, instead of. Well, I don't know how long, how long do you guys take to, to read all your meters? Is it weeks? Two days. Huh? 
Six guys, two days. Six guys, two days. Okay. Okay. As usual. That's pretty fast. Yeah. Yeah. I know some systems take longer than that because they don't have as many people um, doing it. So. Too bad it's 12 day man days. Mm hmm. The other thing, when we were having the discussion about Crusher Canyon, I remember discussion about, about being at approaching or beyond uh, water rights capacity in estimated 12 years. But this report says that in 20 years, we're still good. Can you... And I know that Justin wasn't there at the previous yeah. one. Can you uh, reconcile either my memory or what the difference between those two numbers are? Yeah, I believe that that um, I, like like you said, I was not was not at that. Um, I did talk to Ted about it a little bit, and I I believe that came from um, looking at and analyzing uh, a two percent growth option um and and um in the system so i know that was one of the big differences is if we were to apply a two percent um growth rate um annual growth rate um to the system then that would definitely change the uh the projection values well it was that and also that we felt that putting that sewer line up there would uh, stimulate growth at the faster rates is the reason why that that's a little bit different cliff yeah well i think too this is uh jeff peters that uh we were also talking about that that would be the two percent growth or more all within you know it could be within five years or within 10 years you don't know but it's all within that particular geographic area that wasn't taking into account the other growths that could occur outside of the Crusher Canyon basis. So it was a, an idea to get it. And like, if Crusher Canyon was to develop all the way, um, where would we be? And when would we need to start acquiring water rights? At what point in time would we need to start looking? And the answer was um, as soon as possible, because we, you know, if we put that up there and we bring development there, we're likely going to be over that at that 2% growth or better. And, um, and we're going to be, you know, needing to start looking at, at different options. Well, you also have to remember, we were talking about instantaneous rights versus our overall water rights. And so that's why we're talking about <clears throat> going out and trying to work with the ecology to get our instantaneous rights equal to our total water rights. Mm -hmm. I agree with Cliff. I have a, a little bit of a problem in balancing what we talked about last time of saying we'd run out of water in 12 years at a 2% growth. And we're now saying we can go 40 years um, and we'll still have plenty of water. So what is it? Uh, 20 years. Yeah, it's it's a twenty year projection, and um, yeah, yeah, and you know it's not. Um, let's see. So Cliff, it's, it's, it's kind of like this. These are two, there's, these are basically, uh, the Crusher Canyon is, is a sub look at a, at a, at a particular area. And uh, mm -hmm. Councilman Bell, um, you know, when, what we're talking about here is that Justin is preparing the water system plan saying that based upon the, uh, the growth rates that the, the Council of Government put forward when we did our comp plan, which was the correct me if I'm wrong, 1.2% or 1.5% or something like that. That's right. Um, growth rate. Then 
if we maintain that, which is what they, they believe that we've been growing at over the last uh, 10 to 20 years, then, mm -hmm. then we would be, we would meet our obligation and everything. And we wouldn't, we wouldn't be uh, outside of our water rights um, at the end of the 20 years. That doesn't mean that we don't need to start looking at other options at some point in time during those, that 20 year period to, to get additional water rights. Um, and then when you look back at the, the study session we did last time, that is specifically looking at a geographic area and saying, where do we want the growth to occur? And, um, and if we go over and spur development in this area, how much of that, those water rights is it going to eat up? And, and how much sooner are we going to have to look to acquire additional water rights to allow that development uh, to occur um, and then uh, a plan for the future? In, in actual numbers, whether we're talking residential businesses or whatever, um, wh what is the difference between 1.2% growth and 2% growth? Are we talking five houses? Or are we talking 20 houses? What? I, without going back to uh, Ted's presentation from last time, I don't have that PowerPoint up, but it had the, the specific number of houses that were going to be with that, that could be built, I guess, in that uh, Crusher Canyon area, giving, given the uh, topographic constraints and otherwise uh, land use constraints in that area. Um, I wanna say it was 2000 houses or residential connections, but I'm not positive on that. Okay, Jeff, I, I'm still having trouble uh, with this because I thought last uh, meeting that you had indicated that even though we were projecting at 1.5, that our actual growth over the last five or six years had been at 2%. Um, do we know for sure what that number is? Well, based upon our comprehensive plan, I, I'm not exactly understanding because I was not here through for the development of your comp plan. I was only the, remember, I came in at the very tail end when we were uh, being waylaid by the Indians and, and uh, holding up our comp plan updates. So I worked it through at that point in time, but there's, there's two different numbers that they have in the comp plan. One is as a... Um, a year specific number, which was the 1.2. And it just seems to be carried forward um, at some point in time in the past into our comp plan uh, for some of these smaller cities. But when you look at the table, the growth table that they have in our comprehensive plan um, that goes back to about like 20 or 30 years um, in the past, and you add up the, the 10 year segments at the, the averages for those those growth, the growth during those years, and it varies anywhere between about 2% um, to 5%. So I, I believe that the, the Council of Governments maybe uh, just did a, um, a best guess based upon uh, maybe a, a smaller uh, time frame, And that's what we've been planning on. And it's not that the, the information that Justin has used is incorrect because it's what's adopted in our comp plan. Um, so we just have to be careful when we, when we look at water and things and we have development occurring to do the analysis that we did with Crusher Canyon and realize that if we're going to go and allow development to go beyond that and we're growing, then we need to accelerate uh, our, our, our look towards water rights and other improvements to the water system. If I said anything wrong, Justin, feel free to correct me. <laughs> and same, J Joe. Yeah, Jeff, when you were, I, I actually, I found the um, Crusher Canyon presentation just to answer the question on the difference. Um, it looks like a total system ERU difference of almost 1,300. 
And that's the difference between uh, system wide between a 1.2% and a 2% growth rate. So it's, it's quite a few um, ERUs. So, so we're saying that uh, the uh, consumption of water is different than possibly our consum or our rate of growth. Is that correct? Yes. I just... Go ahead, Justin. Oh, I was going to go. I was going to say I didn't. I don't think I understood the question. Sorry. Uh, the the question was was the. Uh, um, our growth rate different than the projected uh, water use rate as far as number of ERUs that we that we had in the Crusher Canyon versus the um, versus the comp plan. Um. I guess another way to word that is is um, residential growth in water use um, at a lower uh, percentage rate than industrial use of of water or commercial use of water. Oh, okay, I see what you're saying. Um, I no the 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 growth rate is assuming. Um, the equal percentage across all categories, system wide. Okay, so that would yeah. reduce that two percent then just there because we know we're not going to have the huge uh, industrial growth, um, or I would assume that that we're not going to have another tree top come in and and consume a, a huge volume of water you know, uh, any other business. Um, Councilman Bell. Oh. We, we, if there was a, another company that was coming in wanting to build a, a, a big water consumer, well, I think we'd have to dog them off. You know, not only is it going to have impact to the treatment plant capacity, but it's going to be an impact to the water system. And do we want to allocate those capacities to a, a, another high volume water consumption type of industry or we want to allow it for residential growth? Well, I believe uh, Ted uh, kind of addressed that at the, at the meeting as well. And, and he indicated that um, that while the, the planning effort was, uh, it was across all the different areas, if you didn't go and grow, say, for example, in an uh, industrial area, you know, which would require more ERUs than, say, the residential demand, then um, in actuality, we, we wouldn't be as close to um, at our, our growth capacity uh, or, or if we didn't have that happen. So, you know, we're actually better off than what we, what we're, we're showing or projecting, but regardless, if the Crusher Canyon project went forward and we needed to, um, and we were growing at that higher rate, um, we still need to be looking towards, you know, gaining additional water rights, instantation, instantaneous water rights um, and, and improving our, our services at some point in time. And so I think that was the, the, the key takeaway from that uh, the presentation. Jackie? Thank you, Joe. On uh, page 114 of this um, presentation, it states that the need for the city to control large industrial water use and explore the potential of transferring existing water rights owned by the industries to the city is discussed in chapter two. As since, since industrial users use 40% of the water, do we know if they any of these industrial users have water rights and if they'd be open to transferring those rights to the city? 
there are a couple businesses in town that have wells and they utilize that water right now and been allowed to for their processing. So I would think as long as they're in business, they wouldn't want to relinquish those rights. Thank you. You're welcome. Russ. How long, uh, how long does it take, what's the time frame to acquire additional water rights, you know, Justin or Joe or? Well, like we said before, the, the, there are several different ways to get water rights. One is you're gonna have to go out and buy them and would have to find someone that has these water rights for sale. And the other thing is to do is to try to get these additional rights from either Natchee Sela or Taylor Ditch irrigation companies. And another one is to, like I say, to, to convert our instantaneous demand. Um, that seems to be probably the easiest, the quickest and the cheapest, but it's still gonna be you know, I don't know, three years, four years to complete that through the time you go through all the process? Yeah, it's a very lengthy process. And uh, water rights are all, all uh, processed through uh, Department of Ecology. Um, and there are several steps that you have to go through um, to complete a transfer. And it just, it always seems to take longer than, um, than you'd, you'd think or expect. So I, I think Joe is right. It, you know, it can, it can take, definitely take three to four years start to finish. Um, so that's why it's something that's, that's important to, to keep in mind um, and, you know, continue to look for opportunity there to, 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 um, acquire stuff that may be available um, uh, because it's not something that happens overnight. Um, you know, it's not going to happen um, uh, immediately when you need it. Uh, the other question, Justin, I had you, you uh, indicated when you initially put forth this uh, plan update to the Department of Ecology, they had some feedback. Uh, any yeah any red flags or, or what was what was the general feedback uh, any con major concerns that they had or is it just uh, further fine-tuning no there there really wasn't um that's a great question i i uh it's been a <laughs> few days since we it's, oh it's been a few months since we looked at those uh joe um most of them are just a, a administrative type questions um there's a couple where they they wanted um, a little bit more data uh, presented. Um, as an example, um, we provide a, uh, a graphical representation of, of uh, the demand curve throughout the year for residential demand. Um, and they wanted to see that for, for all user categories. Um, so there's just a lot of, lot of little things like that that they wanted um, added to the plan and and addressed, um, but no, I don't remember any any major issues. They didn't have any comments with regard to um, projections, um, uh, improvements, uh, finances. N none of those major um, uh, things. They were they're all very um, very much an administrative type comments. Kevin? Yeah, um, I had a question on, and if I read it right, it sounded like a requirement or a recommendation is to have everything above 20 PSI uh, at the locations, but the Yakima Valley School uh, looked like hydrant A was at 10. Is that a concern? And is that something that is in the deficiencies that need to be uh, looked at relatively soon. I'm not sure about that specific location, but yes, there are, there are still some, some um, fire flow deficiencies that exist in the system. Um, one of the ones that I'm aware of, um, 
is off uh, Goodlander. Um, there are some old small pipes that exist over there. Um, let me see. We're talking about Goodlander Heights, Jesse? Yep, yep, Goodlander Heights. Yeah. And see, that's that subdivision that's across from that new subdivision that Steve Wise is putting in. And that was a, a plot that was developed in the county. They hit a well and a reservoir. Their well went dry. The city took it over and tied into it. And those are all a, uh, it's a six inch plastic PVC distribution system in there. So we've got that shown to be, uh, it's on our, our, our long range plans to um, upgrade that to an eight inch water main system. But back to your question about the 20 PSI minimum is, is yeah, for fire protection. Um, mm -hmm. And that's what we try to maintain some of those areas that if it's a single hydrant and it's right towards the end or the upper uh, elevation wise of a pressure zone, it'd be very expensive chore to tie that into a, to the deck zone up. But the fire department can draft um, yes. those systems or those hydrants into their, with their pumps, with their, with their, with their, uh, uh, pump trucks. Right. And they, can, and they can draw that in and boost that pressure and it'll be sufficient and be fine. That's right. Yeah. And, and that, that does happen when sometimes, cause I think the table you're referring to Kevin was the, um, the field test data, um, that the fire department did, um, yeah. three uh, 42. Yeah. Yeah. And so Joe's absolutely right. Um, sometimes when they do those tests and they run their pumps, um, they, they can pull the, the local pressure down um, uh, more than they should. <laughs> so. Okay. So, Suzanne? Yeah, I was thinking back, Justin, to what you were saying about how helpful it would be if we could reduce the peak usage dur during the summer and how that would increase the available capacity to the system. Do you yeah. have thoughts on how we could promote low water use landscaping, either maybe to new builds or homeowners who are maybe wishing to convert high water usage landscaping to lower? Um. I think, well, there's a, there's a few things. I think I, I know, um, obviously if there's some in, uh, incentive tied to, to doing uh, low water use um, type of landscaping, uh, I think that would be beneficial, that would help. Um, one of the things that we identified in the plan and talked about was just kind of keying into um, the heritage garden uh, stuff that the um, city of Yakima and Yakima County are promoting. Um, uh, just, just promoting those workshops and having people, um, I think just getting awareness out there of the options and availability um, is, 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 uh, is helpful. Um, the other thing to do is to look and I, I don't, I mean, I don't know uh, the ins and outs of your codes, but I know some some communities they still have um, um, items in there uh, referencing um, green space requirements and that kind of thing, and and maybe just kind of um, I don't know that you guys do, but but if if there is references like that, maybe just over time th thinking about. Um, you know, changing the way way those requirements are are framed or worded might be beneficial too. Um, just on the um, on the, uh, the the code requirement end of things. Um, Joe, do you guys have any of that kind of stuff in your code well, that you're aware of? Parking lots still require, I think, five percent of the area it needs to be landscaped and it doesn't say it has to be green space, but okay. that's what a lot of people think. And, and when some folks have come in, we've steered them towards dry land landscaping. You'll see a few homes around town, but that's the problem with having water being cheaper, the more you use. 
and everybody, I don't know, wants to have a green front yard. Um, it'd be interesting if you guys ever think about it, pull up a Google Earth and look at Sela along Fremont, especially I've noticed that um, on West Fremont, you get down there and you'll notice that people's front yards appear quite green and their backyards are, are pretty brown. And they're doing that just because they're trying to conserve water to, to bring their bill down. But um, like I say, if, the, if you keep with the more you use, the, the, the less it costs, um, there's no incentive. And I've brought this up to council's past and, and then didn't get a real good response. So, but we're throwing it back out there again about going to a different tier system. Like I said, the only thing we got we have to be careful with is, is that we don't conserve ourselves into a deficit. So, and that's kind of the reason why we've got a flat rate for our sewer system. Obviously, because also because we don't meter the, the, the sewer discharge out of these homes, but still, yeah, we're gonna have to look at that and come up with some ideas. Yeah, there's definitely value in, in savings. Um, you know, when you compare it to the, um, the cost of acquiring new water rights um, and, um, you know, the cost to, to, uh, to produce and provide the water service, um, you know, there's, there's definitely real savings there um, in comparison. If you can um, conserve water to have more available, Joe, do you want to bring up the like the John Campbell campus? How we're get, getting that off domestic and onto irrigation water? Yeah, they, they were using domestic water during this rehab. I think Ty brought up to I'm not sure who in the Seattle school district, but you know now is the time to tie into the uh, Natchez Sela irrigation water that they currently utilize for their uh, middle school. And so they will be tying in that line and running it across First Street and hooking into the new John Campbell site. So I can't remember the number of homes that was equal to 25, 50 homes or something like that. So yeah, we do offer suggestions. So Kevin? Uh, I had a question on that uh, graph on uh, figure 2.2. It showed all the different types of water usage and you had one in there labeled irrigation only. How is our, how is the city water or where is the city water used for irrigation only? Well, some businesses will put what they call a deduct meter in and they will meter the water that is utilized for the uh, their their landscaping and so those are what we call irrigation only meters okay well i don't see any more hands oh there's one jaggy Thanks, Joe. Yeah, I was uh, looking at the summary of findings for well seven. What do you think the future for that well is and the water that we have using from it? Well, we just recently got that well back online with that new uh, 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 turbine pump. And so it's just, we just got it back up and running and we got the, uh, drawdown gauges in there. So we will be monitoring that and seeing how it's going to produce. Um, as we talked about it, you know, last year that um, the pressures on that, you know, that was an artesian. And so the, the pressures that was in that well have been slowly going down over the last 20 years. And so that's why we, we had a an above ground centrifugal pump that withdrew the water from that well. So now we've lowered a, a, a sort of pumping bowls down into the well and put the motor on top. And so now we're, we're pumping uh, uh, a 
different method. And so we'll see how that goes, but we're just going to have to monitor and see. I mean, nobody knows. Um, they could last that way for a long time or it could just flop and go down in a few years. We don't believe it'll do that, but. No, but, but we did, we have in, in looking at the past data from that well, we have found that um, with con um, increased use, um, the, the water level does trend downward. So definitely something that we'll uh, need to keep a close eye on um, uh, as uh, that needs to be utilized more. So it's one of your, uh, what well, is your largest um, water supply source and is a uh, very important um, uh, to the system. So critical one. Sherry? You're muted. Um, you said that a couple of the warehouses are using well water also? Yes. What are, is there a significant change in their water usage if their well goes down that they pull from the city? Mm. What they do is they use it to fill their packing lines. Uh -huh. And to replenish water from, you know, obviously when they sink bins, water comes out and when they, when they move apples across and they rake the leaves out of it, all that stuff, they consume water. So it's not a, you know, I don't know what they pump out of those wells in a year. So I can't really tell you what would happen if they went down. Okay. But I know that they, they, they utilize that water for their operation. Um, and that's what it's basically as far as their packing lines. Okay. Russell? Oh, on that, uh, just following up on that comment, Joe, um, there are some processors in the city of Yakima who are working towards uh, assessing the viscosity of their water that they're using to, to clean the apples uh, and to, to be able to conserve water, what's the rate of con conservation for the water usage because they use a lot of water. And so they're assessing the viscosity of that, uh, of, of their water to see how often they have to, to uh, recycle it. Are we seeing the same, those same efforts here in SELA? And, and if not, how are we encouraging them? I believe one of the uh, oldest packing companies here in town did put a water conservation uh, system in place a number of years ago. Um, yeah, I know that they, they can see they're, they're cognizant of it, but yeah, we haven't seen a change in their really consumption any, so I don't know. I mean, I don't know. Yeah, la last I heard, it was just a, a study on it that they were doing on, on it and, and hadn't made any uh, sort of uh, assessment, but, but their their massive water use is, is an expense to them and a and a draw on the on the city, so that was that was the benefit of that that uh, study. Well, even another fruit processor in town did do some conservation methods a number of years ago to reduce their water consumption. I mean, obviously, they want to reduce their monthly bill as well, because um, their monthly bills are not only on water, but it also has an effect on their sewage bills, unlike residents which sure are flat rate. So it behooves them to try to reduce those, those meter consumptions. Kevin? Yeah, it's not a question. This is just for everyone's notice. If everyone remembers when the drought was in California and they cut down the water use, the cities had to go back in and raise the water rates because they weren't having enough money to pay uh, for operations. So just because we saved water doesn't really do much in as far as uh, money-wise, just water use. Well, okay. 
our next process is, is that we're going to um, try as much to finalize this document as well as we can with comments that we've not only got here, but we're, we'll be waiting. I think the Department of Health has 90 days, is it, Justin, to submit yeah. their latest set of comments? So, yeah. Um, yeah, we provide, we provide them with um, uh, responses to their original comments um, and then uh, an updated uh, draft of the plan. And then they will uh, notify us. Um, they, they call it um, a notice that they are ready to approve the plan. Um, and at that point, uh, like Joe said, it's, it could be uh, three months from now. Um, we'll, we'll bring it back um, to, to you guys for review and, and final adoption. What I was thinking we would do is we'll bring it back to you with a outline of, we can also provide, I guess, we have the comments from health, but we can tell you what we've changed. So you guys don't have to reread the whole thousand page document again. You just look at the, uh, the uh, areas that have been revised and we can kind of streamline the next meet, uh, time we meet because we'd like to get this adopted and get it behind us. Suzanne. The, um, the comments from health and the responses um, are in the draft that we provided starting on page 242 of the PDF, just so you guys know. Thank you. I, I just wanted to say thank you for the thorough presentation and uh, the time you take to answer all of our questions and putting it into lay terms, maybe for some of us that aren't super familiar with it. It was. Uh, easy to follow along and I just appreciate all the time and work that went into this. Yeah, you're welcome. You. Okay. And, and I, I'd like to say, you know, thank Joe and Ty and uh, Jeff, because, you know, we've had a lot of back and forth and, and it's been a lot of work on everybody's part, um, pulling together the information, the data to, to put this together. Um, so And just because it's a 10 year document, things change, things happen, you know, uh, uh, new projects come into need, and whatnot. So there's, um, don't be surprised if you see a revision uh, want, wanted to be done to this document and resubmitted to health. So it is kind of a living document. Yeah, sure. Cliff? The fact that it's a living document and, and it's a plan, what you just said, sort of rang a bell with me. If there is some other water main break or something like that, or some unexpected development where we're not looking right now, <clears throat> that isn't addressed in that plan is that obviously something that we go and take care of does that mean that we have to revise the whole plan at that point or is there leeway outside of what this document says you don't have to revise the whole plan first of all if there's a a major major let's say an earthquake and we lose a reservoir, those are emergency repairs. And there are several different ways to do that. If we've got the money and reserves, we can repair that. If we don't have enough, you can make emergency applications to, to the uh, Department of Drinking Water uh, Public Works Trust Fund for uh, uh, emergency repairs. Um, a big subdivision that comes in um, if it requires a system, overall system change, then those get sent to the Department of Health for a review. If it is a incidental improvement, one that's been outlined in the discussions in the document, now we don't have to resubmit it and don't have to redo it. Okay. 
Okay. Well, thank you all. Looks like you got uh, 30 minutes <laughs> to go take a break and come back for the meeting start. So, but thank you. Yep. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. We'll take a 30 minute break and we'll be back at 530.